No, no, there is no five finger. Oh, I see what you're saying. You are part of basically hard luck. Basically, 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 basically hard luck. Car shot, Steve Smurdy was a hard luck. Pips and car shot, Steve Smurdy was a hard luck. You are part of basically hard luck. Good morning, it's Westside Santa Monica. This is Chumahan, the uh, elegant barbarian American Indian, Southern Californian, and I am coming, leading the show because our homie, our big homie, Big Lux, uh, is resting up. He's he's off of the surgery, just coming off of a surgery, shoulder replacement. The shout out to Big Lux from the Hard Luck crew. And uh, we got, uh, who else do we got in here? We got old Blue Eyes. Sean Lewis. Santa Monica. Certified audio professional. Engineer. Hey, I said, where you from? From from the Hard Luck Show. Hey, I said, where you from? From the Hard Luck Show. All right. And then we got, right, we got over here with a camera and looking weird. Who is it? I'm from West Side. Uh, uh, uh. All right, that was my cousin, King Salmon. And then, of course, we got... Big, Big pick. pick Mike, DJ Mike Angelo. Yes, sir. I'm from West Side. Uh, uh, uh. Earbuds, what's happening? Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Earbuds. And in the studio today, we have a social justice warrior, a man who needs no introduction, a man wearing a gray beanie that's knit, a man that goes by the name of Oscar. Come on, Oscar! Oscar! Hola, how's everybody doing? <laughs> West Side, uh, uh, uh. We're doing great. So, Oscar, we were just getting started. We we're talking about um, you working on some social justice stuff, right? Well, I mean, I'm an artist, so as much as an artist could address uh, issues of social justice issues. So, so what kind of art? Uh, I've been focusing on public artworks uh, for quite a while now. Does that mean spray painting? It does involve quite a bit of spray painting, um, but primarily we've been doing a lot of work with uh, different institutions. Uh, so I have an art collective, uh, 3B Art Collective, uh, that's primarily made up of um, Chicanos and indigenous uh, cats, uh, along with uh, now my little sister who's been helping out with a couple projects, and uh, she's African American. So hmm. kind of a, you know, a black indigenous uh, POC, we're working together to, uh, to do large public art projects okay so like what give us an example of a large public art project that you guys worked on we're working the current project we're just starting right now yeah um is for the hilda solis uh care first village uh over by homeboy industry on vignes okay there's a transitional housing campus there so we're going to be doing uh murals and artwork for the entire campus and how mu- i mean how big is that like what are we talking about um as far as buildings or as yeah footage, like as, or? as far as like however you want to describe it you're doing these murals how big are these murals going to be it's it's huge um it's by far the largest project we've gotten uh so we're talking about two three-story buildings yeah um and god how many trailers um i don't even know how many trailers but it's it's uh let's see we're talking about hundreds of units for for transitional housing, and that's all going to be painted. And what are you guys going to put on there? Uh, different things, a few murals um, right, that are going to go what? on to. Well, they they wanted we a lot of the stuff that we develop has to do with uh, input from community staff. Um, almost everything we do has community involvement. So what they wanted is things that had to do with. Um, we initially came up with the, the idea of. Uh, Kind of these uh, motifs of the environment, things that are. This this project was crazy because we had to do a lot of work with uh, a lot of consultation because of the people that are going through the through the transitional housing. Uh, we had to take a lot of things that have to do with mental health and uh, so a lot of different things into account when we were coming up with uh, the different motifs. So they wanted things that were uh, a little bit more uplifting, uh, things that have to do with LA, kind of where they are in so like, Chinatown. So uh, we have everything from. A lot of things have to do with with nature, wildlife, uh, cranes, but also things that have to do with with um, I don't know. How did you positive, positive kind of this positive? Yeah. How did you guys get selected to be the ones to create the murals for this transitional housing? We at this point, I 
we've done a, a ton of projects. So the the way it typically typically works is that they put out a call. So whenever anything gets built in LA, there's a one percent that goes into artwork. So one percent of if the projects, you know, some of these projects are humongous, right? So one percent always goes into the arts. So then what they do is they put out. Uh, a request for qualifications and so you have to submit your portfolio resume whatever and then they do if you become a finalist from there if you get picked from the list then um, then you do a proposal so so when they send the bat signal up right mm -hmm. and you guys get your stuff together to submit <clears throat> do you actually propose anything first or they're just looking at your experience and qualifications so this is this is the difference between a I mean, they call it an RFQ, request for qualifications, yeah, and an RFP, a request for proposal. proposal. And for the proposal, you usually get paid for that. So right. if you come up with the proposal, then then if you get selected, then you get the full project. So I mean, this sounds like actually kind of like a massive undertaking. It's like even if they select you in the first round, doesn't necessarily mean that you're selected for whatever. There's still more to go, or is it they pick you right out of the the lot? The it's extremely competitive yeah and so there's a and there's actually a, a very small pool of people who are, who are able to do this uh and for the longest time it was the same people over and over and over again that were getting picked for these projects because they already have the experience right and so the and one of the things that would also hold people back before is that you had to have worked with a certain budget to be able to even apply so if you hadn't worked with the budget say for like twenty five thousand or whatever yeah if you, had, if you hadn't managed that budget you couldn't even apply for a bigger project so if the if the budgets were like fifty or hundred or whatever, you had to kind of qualify for it. So you you weren't even qualified if you hadn't done one for like ten or twenty or whatever. So even getting your foot in the door was difficult um, because how are you going to get that first project? And so we were very strategic when we started doing public art, where we were sometimes self funding projects just so we would have a portfolio. How many people are in the group or the team or whatever? When you say we started, you know. Um being strategic right how did how many of the core group was there there there's five people uh -huh. in the in the collective um and the way we started was uh i ended up going to school much later in life so i ended up at ucla um in 2013 okay and uh and so there's in these art programs there's not a lot of chicanos indigenous people especially in these institutions right what, what's mostly in there and like like don't try to be polite like what's really going on honestly there were i met more people from from korea than from the east side really yeah and what why is that because it's the means right so first of all people that are and this is a big deal when it comes to the uc system is is how do you even pay for the public uh, you know these public schools and so what happens is a lot of the money comes from people that are out of state and out of and out of the country, where they pay a lot more to go there than somebody from from inside California. Sean, do you get that? Do you understand what he's saying? Yeah. What is he, he saying? Are you saying that more people more people from overseas than there are from local? And why would UCLA want to do it that way? Because they get more money. Exactly. Right. Yes, and so this this has they've actually been changing, and so so for the first time they admitted a lot more people um, from <laughs> Los Angeles. UCLA was like, you know what? It's in our fucking name. Maybe we should start admitting some students from fucking Los Angeles, right? It's it all goes back to <laughs> to lack of funding, right? So yeah, so the state had to pony up more money, and then there's a deficit now. So man, it sounds like bureaucratic bullshit to it's me. It's a lot brother. of yeah. It's it's a lot of. Um, I mean, if don't I mean maybe I'm fucked up, maybe I'm the fucked up one, but isn't it like indigenous and Chicano people that basically created the style and the art of Los Angeles and before Los Angeles? Yes. All and, right. I mean, so call me crazy, right? But maybe we should like make the way for the people who've actually worked in it, developed it, built it. Like I don't know, is that wrong? I mean, maybe I'm I mean, fucked now, up. I mean, now we have to just address colonialism, right? Like, I mean, let's do it, dude. Point. I mean, we just got so. done talking about catheters and the other shit, so let's talk about <laughs> colonialism right now. Fuck. Uh, I guess they go hand in hand, man. So, so how did you? So you said you went to school late, right? Two two thousand thirteen. What was the reason that you decided to go at a later time? Uh, well, come it wasn't on, really, man. it wasn't really a choice. What um, do you mean? And again, we. 
I, I mean, it's basically systemic racism. So there was all these things that kept me from, from going into higher education. And, and it had a lot to do with the really terrible education that I had when I was younger. Mm. And a lot of that has to do with racism. And uh, I'm a bit older now. And so what happened was when I was going through school, nobody ever noticed that I had a learning disability. And, uh, and What pretty, kind of learning disability? So I have dyslexia and I also flip num- like numbers. So I'll, it's called this dyscalculia, which I didn't even know existed. Dyscalculia? Yeah. And so Damn. I didn't even know that existed, right? So so it was pretty much impossible for me to do, do algebra. Um, so hold on, hold on. And I, and I don't mean any disrespect, but I want to slow down here because I feel like people, first of all, I feel like people don't who don't have dyslexia or dyscalculia right i don't know that they can relate or really understand what's really going on so can you walk us through your experience from a subjective level right before you even know what you have let's say right you're just like what in, when did you first notice it so i mean i i could give you just an example of, yeah of how difficult it was for me to okay so just background so um Nobody noticed I had learning disability. Go to high school. By the time I'm 15, I get kicked out of school. For what? For just, just had a terrible time in school and whatever. And there was beef with people, but whatever. I won't get into the specifics. Were but I got, you dropping like M80s in the toilet? No, nah, that was, well, those are my homeboys. But, um, <laughs> no, but I mean. It, it smoking was, in the boys' room? Nah, stuff was pretty serious back then. Like, serious? Yeah. Like, uh, I mean, I grew up in San Gabriel Valley and there was, there was still a lot of. A stuff lot of stuff going, going on. on. Yeah, yeah, and there was a lot of... And then it got even crazier because people were leaving, like, South LA and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden we had, like, Bloods and Crips in our neighborhoods mm-hmm. that were... So then, and the homeboys around there weren't having it. So there was all kinds of beef going on. Gotcha. Um, but whatever. And so whatever, I I mean, I was, like, like not involved in a lot of that. But, I, I mean, in contrast, you know, thinking back now, we're like, man, that shit was crazy, but... Back then, we we're like, well, we're not doing anything that bad because it was hardcore gangbangers. Like, I mean, like, dude, all we do yeah. is stab a dude. Like, what's wrong with that? Like, we didn't even fucking. <sighs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> all we did was cut a guy's pinky off. I mean, fuck, oh, we didn't I, shoot anybody. I, knew, I, actually, <laughs> I actually, one of my earliest memories is actually of some some um, some fool getting his fingers cut off what? Uh, in the neighborhood, and what? there was like this long blood trail, and <laughs> like I was a little kid following it in my bike. And uh, I don't know what this guy did, but he pissed someone off in the neighborhood, and they cut they cut off his fingers, man. Wait, wait, wait! I don't mean to laugh, but it sounds crazy because you're like, well, my, my earliest. So what happened? You were riding your bike, and you're like, holy shit! There's a whole. Nah, that was the next day. Like it happened at night, and it was like all kinds of stuff madness going on, right? And cops coming around and asking stuff, <laughs> yeah. and the dogs are like, they have the dogs around. And later we found out what happened, right? The next morning we see this long blood trail for like two blocks. Um, Did you find any of the fingers? Nah. Oh. <laughs> Damn. That's what the dogs were for. <laughs> yeah, they were like um, a snack. Nah, but it, and, and it's crazy because those those blood stains would never really went away. They just oxidized, right? And um, But anyways, and those are, those are things that I remember. Like Right, but did do you think that that, did that traumatize you at all? Or was it like, nah, nah that was just life? Well, that's the thing we talk... My, my partner is in the mental health field. And okay. uh, is a pretty amazing person, does a ton of work and runs programs for the county and stuff like that. But um, but anyways, and so we, we talk about resiliency, right? Like how, how subjective that is where... Or we don't, we don't really understand it. Where we, the way we've dealt with our traumas because we, for so long, probably put up with madness, right? Like all these things growing up. Um, and we didn't really think about it as a trauma. It was just okay these are things we have to do and uh and i probably developed like another like serious mental disorder i probably had like a more like a split personality thing going on just to be able to deal with the things the that are very worlds, traumatic yeah. yeah yeah so when did you discover like when di- when as a kid at what point in school were you like fuck i don't understand any of this shit well it started getting difficult right around third fourth grade and uh and then i just was getting into a lot of trouble by the time i was in sixth grade mm-hmm. um and but I would get picked on when I was younger, and so then by the time I, like, I shot up, like, right around fifth or sixth grade, mm-hmm. uh, and then I just started getting into a lot of fights after that. You were like, yeah, there's going to be some fucking accounts settled around here, No, because, I've, I mean, I've never, I've never been that due to, like, I never enjoyed hurting people, you know? You it, seem like a gentle guy, like, you come across yeah, as a gentle and, dude. But, I mean, I hated seeing people get picked on, so that, so... So, so we get in fights all the time in the elementary realm. Well, dude. because I already knew what it felt like, right? right? So like the first, you know, 
first through fourth, I would get picked on. And then after that, they wouldn't pick on me as much. Like, I'd get in fights and whatever. But the other cats were getting picked on, and I would defend them all the time. Right. And so that kind of ended up being my role most of my life, really, is thinking about the underdog or people just... I, I just hate to see injustices. Fuck, dude. And it's this- a hard world to live in i was gonna say dude yeah that sounds pretty tough around here so then all right so you you have a when did you actually get diagnosed so so i get kicked out of school right and uh and then i'm i'm trying to do jc's whatever right and back then we didn't even really have access to computers whatever right and so then i end up um just giving up on school right you're like fuck it yeah whatever couldn't couldn't transfer so um, just started doing graphic design and art for for pretty much. Let's see, I had my first studio back in '97, and so in uh, uh, over in the Pomona Arts Colony, which was really great. But then, fast forward to 2012, uh, when I meet my partner, she she realized right away, like, oh yeah, you're you're dyslexic. And How did she know? She works in the mental health field. Right. So she's like, oh, man, not only are you crazy, but you're fucking dyslexic. Oh, she immediately was, like, diagnosing me. She was like, hmm. She's like, you got ADHD, but OCD tendencies. And, <laughs> you know, and, it, and yeah. And it, Is that and annoying it, a little bit, though? Like, on no, some not level? at all. Oh, you no. ever be like, hey, man, can you cool it, Dr. Freud? Like, I'm just, it's just me, no, man. No, I'm, I'm actually excellent at diagnosing. Are uh, you? Oh, yeah. I'm really good at it. And, and it's, look, at, look at this man right here. <laughs> well, okay. I have to actually. No, no, him. look at him. It's... <laughs> He says, I'm pointing at you. Yeah, old blue eyes. All right. He says that he's an introvert. Does mm-hmm. it, are, can you diagnose that? Can you see that in him? No, you well, say I'm an introvert. <laughs> no, you say <laughs> No, you say <laughs> <laughs> What about this guy? Look at this guy at the end. Look at his turgid eyes. <laughs> turgid eyes. <laughs> Look at his eyes. What, what's going on with him? Man, he's a fun guy. Yeah, he is actually. He's a funny guy. I won't even ask you about being with Mike because I know, <laughs> I know his thing is, uh, you know, private. I'm talking about traumas, man. But <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Did he tell you about? He's only got nine toes. Yeah, right. Oh yeah. Yeah, we. So he tells us that every day. Now, going back to your situation. All right. So, so, um, okay. So your partner's like, hey, this and this and this and this. And did it make sense as soon as she told you? Like, oh, I, I had already figured it out. Oh. So then, so then, what happened was, um, but I but I couldn't get diagnosed, right? right? Because then all of a sudden, if you're not a kid in in school, yeah, then it's extremely difficult to get anybody to get you to to be diagnosed as an adult, right? And especially then, like, what are you gonna do, right? And um, and so then I I had to look into it because of my daughter. Um, she started having problems in school, and I and I was like, oh, I think she's fine, but I definitely have dyslexia. And so when when my partner told me, I was like, yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure. But there was things going on at that time where where I f- I wanted to kind of move up when it came to to my art practice, and so I wanted to do residencies, and I was applying for some grants. And she told me, you know, you're you're never going to get these unless you you go back to school and and mm. get your, get your degree. And so I was like, that's not going to happen. And we and she pointed out every single person who were getting these had their MFAs. Um, and so then she said, what is it, really, what is it going to take for you to go back? And I said, it's got to be UCLA and it has to be a full ride. And then um, she said, okay, so we'll, we'll make it happen. And, and yeah, ended up uh, going to ELAC, uh, which then was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. What is ELAC for the uninitiated? <laughs> East LA College. <laughs> oh. And so I had to do math. And so I basically had to go from basic basic math to quadratic equations in six months all right hold on then you got dyscalculus or dyscalculus dyscalcula, yeah right? so, so Count, like, a, good ex- a good example is is say i'm doing algebra and there's there's an f and a five in the problem i will flip that it's because just because five starts with an, with f. an f in in my brain has a misfire, so it, so it isn't even. I think I'm doing it right, and my B's and D's forget it. Like I flip those all the time. So dog is bog, and it, all the time I'm dog flipping. Dog is God. God is yeah, dog. yeah, right. And so so then I had to I had to do it so much that it it circumvented the short circuit and became muscle memory. Right. So I had to do math for probably around twelve hours a day for like six months, and. And just so I could go to UCLA, just so I could get there. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Earbuds, are you listening to this? Listen to this. 
right? You guys all claim that you like David Goggins, and you claim that you're inspired by his story about how he had to write down everything. You're listening to a guy, okay? To get into UCLA had to do 12 hours of math for six straight motherfucking months. That's dedication. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's not because you love math. It's because you got to do something and this is what they're asking you to do. That was the price to pay to level up. Fuck, yeah. man. Yeah. The, that was, what do they call it? The escape velocity, right? Like, mm-hmm. what you have to do to, to, to get out of that that uh, force that's keeping you how did you space? stay focused man like did you listen to rocky music or what did you do <laughs> no it was it was um i was i was like uh i think it's from east of eden where where they say um in that line there's this one character and they say that that in order for somebody to really be su- the people that are more successful they 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 think of their goal they figure out what it is that they want and then they forget about it only focus on the next step and so I had to I had to do it no matter what the cost was that was something I had to do and I had to figure it out and that was it did you have dreams about numbers and shit oh yeah all the time I was dreaming I was dreaming quadratic equations I was it was insane and what like so what's the journey like I mean to me on some level there's a monk aspect to what you're talking about which is like you kind of like sequestered yourself you're like this is the next step I'm not gonna think about the whole thing I'm just gonna hunker down I'm just gonna fucking do this right and you must have like did, at any point did you like say fuck this I'm not doing it anymore or was there any, did you nah, go through emotions but there, there were times where I was like Man, fuck this teacher because they they didn't think I could do it. <laughs> right? Because they because I was struggling from the very beginning, and so they didn't. They were like, "You have to retake this class." I was like, "There's no way I'm gonna retake it. I'm, I have to, just continue doing this over and over and over, until I'm able to do it." Mm-hmm. Because there was there was no, like, second chances. Uh, and then once I was accepted to UCLA for sure, like there was no, no looking back. I had to get everything done and did you actually come to any insights about math or numbers having that much intimacy with it i mean i've the thing is i i've i've worked in in design and packaging and a lot of the stuff i do requires very exact math right so but it has more to do with with measurements and the way things uh line up and it's just very different things and now i'm working with things that are architectural and so i mean i Math is nice. It's a it's a language that is absolute, and unlike our language, which is very. Um, I don't even know how to explain it. Sometimes I have to explain things in Spanish, right? Where it makes a little bit more sense, and and I even like the idea of um, how there's there's so many concepts that can't even be explained, right? So mm. so especially when it comes to like indigenous uh, languages, where where there there are no translations for things, right? And so language oftentimes fails us. Yeah, I think I think I think you're right. So in in one sense, right, and you get this this idea is that math is in some ways kind of universal and precise, right? There's there's um, in Tokyo two plus two is going to be four. In Los Angeles two plus two is going to be four, and certain measurements or whatever. But right, and the 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 geometry that Pythagoras and everyone's doing, that's the same. It hasn't changed over millennia at all. And then you get to language and you're like, words fail us or whatever. And it is clunky, right? It is. Language is clunky. And it is um, sometimes impossible, right, to translate, like you're saying, words or feelings or uh, experiences in an indigenous language into... My tribe, the Sklalem tribe, we don't have a word for hello. Because we don't think it's that big. If you fucking showed up, obviously you made it. Why do we have to say fucking hello? But in our society, right, it's an assumed, like, you're going to say a hello or a greeting to acknowledge that this person showed up. But the flip side is, is like, sometimes I think maybe for indigenous, um, it's not so much the language but it's the assumptions of the culture that they're based on so like in america right 
some of the assumptions, this is something I was talking to somebody, I can't remember who I was talking to this about, but like, even if you're an atheist in the Western world, even if you don't believe in God, even if, right, even if, somehow this idea that you're not part of nature, humans aren't part of nature, they got kicked out or they're somehow removed or they're fucking it up or whatever, somehow that's a part of the discussion mm -hmm. already. Whereas in my tribe, it's not. There's no story about we weren't, we were kicked out of nature. There's no whatever. There's none of that. It's not even part of the discussion. When you look at indigenous cultures and also thinking about art and mental health, right? What are some of the relationships towards concepts, the way society's kind of maybe set up, how we view mental health? and maybe alternative cultures where it might be different? The, the way, here, here's the thing, the, the, the way that I see, the way that I see the, no, that's not correct either. The way I approach the work has a lot to do with the worldview that I hold that is not a linear way of looking at the world, right? Mm. It's, it's more of a cyclical, like the cycles that, that we're in and that we're able to, and time kind of, um, we all know because of the pandemic and how funny these last few years have, have behaved, right? Where, it, where did this time go, right? It's, it feels very different. Yeah. So we know that time could stretch and expand and contract, right? Depending on what's going on. So, but these are cycles that we're going through and they're, they're the continuing cycles. And I think that's something that, that comes from, basically any like you were saying any culture that doesn't remove itself from from our place in the universe right we and we understand that we don't understand everything and mm. and because of that we have reverence for things that that we don't understand rather than this this kind of idea that that my worldview will define everything right this very european way of looking at things that has to do with like the grand enlightenment or something where everything is going to be reduced to one single answer as if it were math right but that's not the way logic really works hmm. and and that's because we have different worldviews and and that's one of the things i really appreciate of, with everything that i i've learned so far um about so many mesoamerican cultures and uh, native american cultures is um that that there is an appreciation for other worldviews. There isn't this I'm going to force my view onto you. It's that we can have an interchange of of ideas and concepts, and I might adopt some of those. There is a you know, or even the the whole Zapatista scene, right? Of a world where many worlds fit. Right. And so that's the way I try to approach things: is to understand that people are going to have a different experience with the work, and it's all valid. It's a has less to do with my own ego as far as what I'm trying to convey unless I'm really addressing a, a hard topic like things that have to do with police brutality or or very difficult histories things that have to do with um, like right now I'm working on a piece for the social justice the Museum of Social Justice uh, that has to do with um, the history of Olvera Street and this is a tough history I mean we had we had indigenous people being auctioned off we had yeah. uh, so many different things that have to do with um, just police brutality and uh, this myth making of, of Spain having basically populated Los Angeles and it's not it's not an easy story to tell so for who? well right we have to delve into these these things that are very uh, very much uh, erased from from the history why 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 doesn't why doesn't everybody right i was talking to O blue eyes about this off air and we were having a quick conversation and i was telling him like you know i avoided watching reservation dogs for a while mm. because for a couple of reasons number one is sometimes when i watch american indian stuff i get disappointed because you know kevin costner's involved or you know some bullshit right yeah and i know this is grassroots or whatever <clears throat> i stayed away from smoke signals for that reason i just wasn't sure i'm not I don't, so i watch reservation i start watching reservation dogs and i gotta tell you uh you know you know i'm at 24 hour fitness doing an incline working out while i'm watching it and it probably once an episode i either tear up or cry there's something in it but it's it's from this idea of these people that 
you know, are survivors of this thing, and we're not erased. And it's because we're still here, right, that's, y- yes, the land, the, the government did whatever they did, but we're still here. And I was talking to, but there's also positives about it, right? And one of the things, there's the scene where Bear is on the roof with the father of his buddy who killed himself, right? And they have this discussion on the roof while they're roofing. And at the end of it, there's like a sign in the sky, right? Some cloud, something shiny, whatever it is. <clears throat> they don't say anything about it. They both look at it. They see it. They don't say anything. And they just let it be what it is. And at that moment, I realized, you know, coming up, it wasn't odd or strange or wrong or childish on the reservation or for American Indians to make meaning out of nature. It wasn't like every, every individual could look at something. Now, was it really that or not? Nobody really knows, but no one challenges an American Indian to look at his environment or nature and make a, a, make a meaning out of it, right? But for mainstream Americans, and when I say that, I guess I mean white Americans a lot, right? And so, oh, Blue Eyes is my token white friend, and so I, I talk to him about white stuff sometimes to find out what they think. Anyway, so I was talking to him about that, and oh, Blue Eyes said something that was so powerful because he said you know what man there isn't really white people and i'm like yeah and he said the truth is is that the mainstream americans that are here are so cut off from their roots that they're just lost and that's what that is the concept of whiteness is much more of a problem than actual white people right so the concept of a superior dominant culture right is is the biggest problem to overcoming racism one of the things that i think about too is that you know the united states is not that old why well you made a face what is that what are you saying? <laughs> i mean there's it, it i mean it might not be that old but but the the um, these these um very again difficult histories yeah. are long before the US uh they're much older than the United States so you're right so but that wouldn't be the United States so you're right there was people in life here before the United States got started and before it stole stuff totally 1000% correct on that but what i mean to say is is that this country right as a nation, as an artificial construct nation, isn't really that old in the big scheme of things. And I think about it a lot because I think like, well, so what now? Here we are, what now? And the cool thing about reservation dogs is they poke a little bit of fun at some of the overly academic decolonization talk, which doesn't really relate to regular people's experience. But there is something true to it, too, which is like you can't just forget it. So what, what now? And the reason why I bring that up is because I feel like until Americans, right, can feel like all of the histories, the good, the bad, the oppression, the freedom, the struggle, all of that belongs to all of us as, a, as, a, as our birthright as Americans, then, then... Maybe these histories won't be so difficult for some people. I mean, it's as simple as not looking at someone else and saying they're less American. Right. That's it. Like, right. Like, I'm a Chicano, and that's uniquely American. And, I mean, and I say American, <laughs> there's like chanting going on now. Yeah, I know, it's a sign. <laughs> hey, great grandfather said we should be talking right now. Oh. <laughs> okay, go ahead, please. But um, you're right. There is nothing more American, right, than somebody, um, than than the Chicano culture, especially taking spaces that quote unquote weren't intended for them by the master race or whatever you want to call it, and making it their own, developing something out of it, creating a culture out of it, or or preserving one that they already had in it when it wasn't designed for that. Right? Yeah. And the thing is, like you were saying, America has to own it all. I mean, gangs, 
very much American, you know, that they, they started deporting people and then those gangs came back. Like those uh those uh wars, those interventions in Latin America. Yeah. Well that came back to bite us in the ass, right? Like all right. these things and now we don't wanna teach these histories we don't want to learn the lessons from these things yeah there's a big movement lately to try to go away from it i've been doing a lot of research on the black panthers i've been doing a lot of looking at you know sort of the late 60s right before you get something happened where everybody was kind of waking up you had the aim the american indian movement you had caesar chavez you had all those people and it was all coming together and then there was a series of assassinations right and then all of a sudden you get into the superficial, weird, late 70s, 80s. So, so the real revolutionary movement happened in the 70s. And it's been completely erased. What is it? Oh, there, like at that time, I think it was something like there was three bombings a day in the United States. Like it was real, like we're going to overthrow the government stuff that you don't get this history at all. And... And people were serious when they were saying they were going to overthrow the government. Mm. I mean, when they were kidnapping judges, like when they was they were occupying uh, courthouses, like that was that was for real. And most of that happened in the seventies, not in the sixties. The sixties, mm. they were still trying to work within the system and civil rights. Protests. Right. I mean, Malcolm X also was speaking a little bit more realistically as far as the way things had to go, but. The things got serious in the 70s and and that's the part that gets erased and they want to replace it with like i don't know what you know that history that we think happened but this this was serious people were were ready to die for things and it was that's how they saw themselves as as revolutionaries it was very different than this idea of peaceful protest it was like no nah, it was going to be by force and it had gone to that point in the 70s right so the idea being was we tried all the other stuff, right? We tried the movement, right? Uh, the, the peaceful protest, what Gandhi was doing. And so I've even heard from people that said that Gandhi did what he did the way he did it because he didn't have the actual weapons to do. He didn't have oh, yeah. arms. He wasn't a pacifist. And he right. said that. He said, We're, we won't like, rise up, so then I'm going to have to use... The weight of the empire against itself like we're 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 gonna then use pacifism as the weapon right because he's i i actually believe he said that the people were too coward to rise yes up. i i read that yeah i read that he understood and 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 they were that way partially because of the subjugation for so long and he realized the only way to get them out is to do the pacifist thing they yeah. weren't gonna fight yeah. and so you know cut to the civil rights movement you're right in the 60s it's like uh, they did all they could to, for Jim Crow, and some stuff changed, right? But they murdered Malcolm X, Fannie, Fannie Lou Hamer, right? Black Democrats in Mississippi were not allowed to vote in the primary for an LBJ won re-election, and at some point, everybody realized, fuck, it's not going to be through peaceful protests. We have to actually arm ourselves, and we have to fucking take the power. Yeah. Yeah, and that's when we get the 80s. That's where we have this massive backlash. And um, I mean, we basically have been going through, you know, neoliberalism. We had all these, and now we're at what, neo-fascism, I think? Yeah, right? we the, are. It's very bizarre. I'm reading a book called Hitler's True Believers, right? And this author's whole thing is looking at, like kind of saying like, it's too easy to say Hitler was chariz- charismatic and he started all this shit. He's like saying, no, 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 no. There was already uh, just a hotbed of fucking ripe for fascism, ripe for anti-Semitism, all that shit. He just happened to be there at the right time. I, I spent my entire life talking about the racism here in the United States and people telling me it wasn't true, that the United States wasn't racist. It's wild. And then all of a sudden, you know, everything starts happening with Trump. And all of a sudden, I have all these people saying, like, I know. I mean, we're all, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, like George Floyd, all these things happen. And all of a sudden, it was like, oh, let's fight racism. You have no idea how you've been participating in it this entire time. So how are you going to even deal with it? And in going through these institutions that, that really are the ones that, that create systemic racism there and uphold it and this is what i always talk about is that 
there's there's two major state institutions that that basically dictate our place in society, and one of them is a prison, and mm. the other one is is the education system. One and, thousand, and you're being tracked into one or the other, and th- we don't really make anything anymore. So, what are you gonna do, right? You're gonna sell some product on TikTok or something, or whatever you side hustle, yeah, side whatever hustle. side hustle, right? <laughs> because now you're not gonna be tracked into a factory. But for the most part, most people in the hood they get tracked into prisons. Yeah, you know, you're a black and brown kid. That's what's gonna happen. But nobody ever talks about this through a conjoined lens, like of being able to talk about prisons and schools in the same. You know, it's the same thing. It's same. They're both why, state institutions. Why, why are schools set up in the situation where it's up to political parties to determine what our kids are going to learn? I mean, <laughs> seriously, that drives me crazy. That drives me crazy because people get up there, and that, that's why you get Ron DeSantis or whoever it is that's trying to basically. And let me tell you something. In this Hitler's true believers, one of the first things the Nazis did when they seized state power was to kick out all the old school and education system and take it over for young kids. Because they wanted to give those young kids how to think. So now we're here. And I'm thinking about this and I'm like, fuck, man, how are we going to? Because we have to, on some level, I think, we have to open up the tent for the people who are white, who aren't benefiting from the system either and they feel like maybe right that that somehow they're unfairly being positioned and i'm not saying they're innocent i'm not saying that but what i am saying is is like how do we get everybody together that's not really winning in this situation to take back the power i mean even even okay so going back into worldviews right there there are societies or there have been societies where the idea of winning and losing didn't exist. And here we are in a super capitalistic, super hyper individualistic way of looking at the world that is difficult to think of of how do we take care of each other. Right. It's extremely difficult because everything has to do with coming up, but but everything in a capitalist system has to do with some form of exploitation. For sure. We're exploiting something, you know, buy low, sell high, whatever it is, right? We're trying to figure out how to how to all come up. And at the same time, with inflation whatever like we're getting okay we're we might make some more money but really all we're doing is servicing you know these billionaires compounded interest like we have to we have to somehow make more money create more money and nobody nobody has a billion dollars like nobody (laughs) really has a billion dollars like it might be on paper but but every every dollar in circulation is a debt right yeah and so that's the way the system works so we're just creating more debt that's all we're doing when we're creating more money right yeah and so we're we're putting people we're creating pretty much indentured servants in the future like into future generations that was a word it's a sign <laughs> another keep sign. talking about the white man's paper brother <laughs> right you're gonna come <laughs> read us right now hey all right, go ahead, please. No, but I mean, we all, I don't but know if people is, really s- stop and think about the way these systems work. Well, the, the reason why, I, and listen, man, the reason why people don't stop and think about it is because most people are fucking put in a desperate situation. So they don't stop and think because they don't got time. I mean, my buddy, old Blue Eyes, a King Salmon, even me, right? I'm an attorney, right? And so I am part of the system. I mean, let's not fuck around. On some level, I got a daughter, I got a wife, and I'm a lawyer. Right. And so I'm taking money and I'm fucking working within the court system and doing whatever. And that has to be done at this juncture. And, and, and at the same time, though, you're right. How do we for me, it's it's all about education. Like, how am I going to get people to stop and really think? How am I going to motherfucker? How am I going to get people to stop and go like, wait a minute, three quarters of the education for every kid is advertising. It's fucking Ever motherfucking tizing. A fucking cartoon fucking lizard talking about insurance. <laughs> like it's your friend. Not just that, like, okay, let's look at the national like budget. Right. Half of it goes into the military. And so when like with the Ukraine, they're saying, Oh, we're sending more aid. No, you're sending weapons. And so you're you're basically spending that budget. I I I'm and I'm not saying that they don't deserve help. What I'm saying is 
maybe we could spend a little bit more money to try to prevent some wars rather than just how about weapons, we stop right? how about we stop propping up corporations like fuck it if your corp can't make money fucking hit the street jack off it's it's funny how it's always pull yourself up by your bootstraps yeah right? unless, until, you're, like, unless, unless you're unless you're in the c-suite and your name yeah. is stefan mark or some bullshit like that yeah. unless it's that i'll tell you something man um Let's see. Fuck. I don't know. Then I start to get on this. I start getting crazy. Um, so the project that you're doing near Homeboy Industries and it's part of this community, it's transitional housing, and you had to do a lot of consultations, right? Yes. All right. So then what images or what vibes did were you guys able to come up with to be like, this is going to support the energy, the, the... We went back to flora and fauna a lot of things have to do with with because it's it's the city right and yeah. we wanted to and we know that anything that has to do with nature is is much more healing and so we went up with a lot of that and so there is a backdrop of things that have to do with with kind of the location things of chinatown things of downtown um but we wanted to make sure to put in flora and fauna that are that are actually indigenous to the region and so what would that be let's say fauna right let's say well let's say flora first what kind of things, right, are indigenous or from this area where you're like, yeah, we got to put up this fucking, I don't know, century plant that's probably not even indigenous? No, I mean, a lot of things have to do with... Um, like the chaparral. Yeah. Sage. Yeah, things. <laughs> and, and for the most part, I mean, I work a lot with, with iconography, right? And so, because I worked in design for a long time, so it's things that, that you know, you could you could recognize, but... Um, some of the things are, are silhouettes. Some of the things are, are silhouettes worked into words. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of different elements that are in it. There's at least 10 different kind of um, uh, these iconographies have to do with, with uh, different animals, different plants. Um, we're working in words that, are, that have to do with just kind of positive affirmations, different things like that. Um, How yeah, important is an environment? How important is an environment for the human experience i mean that's a i mean that's that's basically what defines us i mean our reaction to the environment is really what defines us i mean we're put into different environments right like you grow up in the hood or you grow up like whatever it is and talking about resiliency is also right i mean i've i've known people who've grown up very privileged that have very little resiliency uh, and other people have grown yeah. up in trust some of the fund people. Conditions. Trust fund people that can't get out of bed. <laughs> yeah, I mean they they someone throws them a loop in something and uh, you know at work or whatever and they get all flustered and other people keep their cool no matter what. Like, so for Mr. and Mrs. Earbuds that are listening, right? And let's say they don't have a budget at all, right? But what are some things that they might be able to do for their interior space that might actually help their <laughs> the easiest thing is get some plants you know when they've done studies about some of the healthiest and longest living um people on earth i think it was in japan where where almost everybody just farms they have their own personal plots and they've they've live like they have the most centurions like people over 100 than anywhere else in the world they and it's because they they have their own farms like small plots at home and they seem to be the happiest, healthiest, and longest living people in the world. What for you personally? What is your favorite plant? Like you're like, yeah, this is the fucking plant. Don't <laughs> fuck with this <laughs> prickly pear, motherfucker. I okay. So I actually okay. I got a story to tell. tell if it. anybody, if I'm, I don't know if anybody even remembers the South Central Farm. So so the South Central Farm was the was the biggest community farm in the country. And I'm forgetting the cross streets right now, but but it it was basically like four city blocks that that people were farming, and they they were set up in into different um, little um, sections that each family got right right from neighborhood, and they were growing everything in there, and so they like sugarcane, like med plants for medicinal uses, everything. Like the community just had this beautiful farm, nopales, cactus, and there's actually a, a a documentary called I think The Farm but it was nominated for an Oscar so look it up I mean it's pretty pretty powerful you know but anyways so so I had 
I had recently gone back from from Chiapas. I spent some time out there with the Zapatistas, with <sighs> with some activists. You know, I met a lot of activists from all over the the country. And I come back and and they're they're evicting these farmers, right? These and it's a crazy story. But so they're they're evicting. So so I'm at work and and I get this call that you know they're raiding the farm and it was one of the biggest like the feds were there. It was huge. It was what? Huge, yeah, there was like. And so I think even when the cops are like, man, it's some like now's the time to rob a bank on the other side of the the city because everybody was there evicting these these people that were there, right? But anyways, so my friends get arrested. Now, people that I know were getting arrested because they were doing civil disobedience. And so then I I get there and they start bulldozing the the farm. By the time I get there, and so I lift the fence up and I I start taking some of the plants that were left. And a lot of them had already been taken out by the by the families. They they knew what was going to happen. And so I get some some nopales, some cactus, yeah. and um. And so I throw them in the trunk of the car, and I'm driving around to different jails, picking people up, and I spend most of the day there. Then I go home, and uh, at that time I was still living with my family, and I and I give these uh, nopales to my to my parents, and I said this this com- came from the Sustainable Farm, and and I was really upset, and they they planted it, and and it's been growing there, and uh, I think like a year later I'm eating nopales, and my mom says those those are your nopales. The ones that you brought from the South Central Farm, and I started gifting them to different farms, different different community spaces, and I've used it in my artwork. And there's there's this one farm out in Bodrego Springs that I they started a community garden there, and I I gave them one of the the leaves, and within a, a year, same thing. They sent me these photos, and there's hundreds of them. They propagated <sighs> them, and uh, and there was people that would go weekly, and they said we've given at least three thousand like of these these uh paddles out like in right. a year and and to me that's 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 part of my art practice right you know but how do you separate resistance these? nopales and and it's and to me it's it's a perfect metaphor for for migration right yeah so that nopal never thought it was gonna end up in pomona and then in Bodrego springs but that's that's where it ended up because of political issues like these challenges that happen how much how long did you spend in chiapas just a few weeks how um, does somebody get down to chiapas would you gotta like hitch that's a, a ride? whole nother crazy story um but i i was actually listening to um a very kind of left-leaning radio station and i heard somebody last minute mention yeah anybody who wants to go on a delegation to uh, Chapas like emails and it was like this cloak and dagger crazy thing because right. it was it was back um, 2005 I think right was sub Comandante Marco still uh, I actually was in the room with him no yeah. Did, was he smoking the a people, pipe was he smoking a pipe no but the people I went with actually ended up doing security for him when he came down to Tijuana so yeah they they had spent months out there like half a year building uh, relationships with the different communities out there and so i mean what was it like being in the room with him and this is a guy that kind of stood down the mexican government and was able to hang in there we were we were actually in the hospital that they had set up in the community when um comandante ramona passed away mm-hmm. like the like we didn't know she was there mm-hmm. uh and they announced it the day after so we were probably visiting that community when she passed away so it's it's just this crazy history that most people don't even know about now. But but yeah, that's it's it's the same story that goes back to colonialism, where the Mayan people were never really conquered. Right. And I mean, they were they've been rebelling basically since first contact. And and um and what is like the countryside like, or like for the person who just lives in Chiapas and they want to be a part of the community and they're just going to live there? I mean, what what is it like? Do they have Houses? Do they farm? Is it everybody working together? How does it? What did you see? I mean, when I was there, I don't know what it's like now. It's yeah. been a while, yeah. but it's it's pretty complex. I mean, most people do farming, right? We were. I I got to see when they were bringing in like the coffee, like the the cosecha, like different things that they were that they were doing. You see maize everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but but it's a very very poor community like most of those communities are very far into the jungle and um into the mountains and that's one of the things that's that's kept them from from really being colonized right but no but but at the same time no matter how far into the jungle we went you would still see churches and coca-cola like crazy like no matter how far into the jungle you would go 
they would they would have Coca Cola. So I mean, it just tells you. One of the first things I saw when I went into San Cristo de las Casas, like the major city, uh, kind of outside of the communities, was a Coca Cola plant, like a giant factory. Fuck yeah, yeah. Man, Oscar, I feel like I could talk to you for another ten hours. I hope you come back. That's an amazing story. I would really like to get you know more into sort of where you think we're going in terms of the country what we can do how do people find out more about what you do in your collective and support what's going on where do they go uh just look 3b collective 3b b as in as in boy all right 3b collective.com yeah and if anybody wants one of these resistance nopales (laughs) where do they write um, <laughs> hit up 3B. I'll, I'll, they'll let me know. Right. But, but honestly, yeah, if somebody wants one, I'll give them one. All right. Yeah. Hey, man. Thank no, you. Thank very you so much. much for having me. Yeah, it was a great, great talk. I think I know I got a lot out of it, my friend, so I appreciate it. And I just want to say to Mr. and Mrs. Earbuds, vibes rolling, paper. Hey, freedom for the people, fight capitalism, but. Vibes Rolling Papers. <laughs> Supermaxhardware.com. Cookies, right? Burner. Burner, Big Burn, Estevan Oriel. And the Soul Assassins. Soul Assassins. Tunes, you know who you are. And mugs. Uh, mugs, DJ Mugs, right? What up? And su- I said Supermax Hardware, right? And Big Lux, heel up on the shoulder, titanium shoulder coming at you. Bigger, badder faster better and uh thanks to monique for helping our man out right nurse monique doing her deal anybody wants to know about acupuncture uh, hit me up on the email i can tell you how to increase your sperm count on that uh <laughs> it's a true story and uh ovanda bone llp we wear braids to court let the tomahawks fly the best legal representation money can buy also big pick mike DJ Primitive, DJ Mike Angelo, King of Mike Angelo Photography. Mike Angelo Photography. Also, Mike Angelo Stereo Install. Uh, just come on down. <laughs> he does everything. He does tinting too. <laughs> Mike Angelo tinting, and uh, he can cut the shocks on your he truck. Pinstriping. Everything, bro. Lower that shit. Slammed it. And then. <laughs> And also custom uh, mufflers, <laughs> custom, custom muff diving, and then right we got no muff too tough. Yeah, he likes it hairy. He likes it scary. Now here comes uh, big salmon, right? King salmon, popping patches, beyond dragon, beyond dragon, dragon bags, dragon bags with a Z, with a Z, beyond uh, dragon. Right, but listen, all of that is horseshit because the real plug is sean at movemental.media for all your audio and podcasting needs and don't forget to hit us up at hardluckshow.com 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 hey while we're kind of ending this out maybe we should give an announcement that um we're gonna ease back on the number of shows per week we're gonna maybe cut it back to two right so what like monday thursday um, I don't know. We haven't decided yet, guys. So you're listening, and we're cutting it back because everybody's working more, actually. Uh, and we've we want to maybe put a little bit more energy into each show. Right. I mean, originally we were just doing one motherfucking show that was like eight hours long. That's basically that's what, right. Right. Yeah. Right. And then we we're like, fuck it, let's dice it up into three. Right. But there's so much inventory and everything else. I uh, think. I think you. I think we'll kind of go back to the format that we had before with like one really good long one or two really good long ones per week. Right. right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see. What yeah. Happens. And um, go to my fucking TikTok, you crazy little fuckers. You little fuckers. Tell them what they can expect. Well, I'll tell you what. You get the American Indian book reviews. I just got done talking about Chuck Berry. I read his book. Uh, fought one of the fathers of rock and roll and also a pervert, I guess. I mean, he had camera holes and shit everywhere and there's pictures of Crazy. films of women defecating in his mouth. That's in the book. I didn't say that. That's in the book. Um, also, uh, you'll also hear um, on part 12 of the Black Panther histories. Dude. Part 12. Yeah. And also, you will get some indigenous histories. Nice. Uh, 
talking about uh, Lorena Ramirez of the Raramuri tribe that was also not conquered in the mountains of Chihuahua. And the Chihuahua is a native dog. It, yes. Yes. It's the original native dogs, and there's a ton of them, right? Here in for 9,000, 10,000 years, although I don't buy into the side, the, the ice bridge story. Okay, okay. All okay. right. And there we go. <laughs> hey, hey adios, have, amigos. Go ahead, go ahead. I, I actually have two cholos, two uh, indigenous dogs. Nice. Yeah, we're going to do an indigenous dog show, bro. That's right. Fucking A. We will. Fucking A. All right. All right. And about this time, we say what? Adios, amigos. From the, From hard. the hard Look Show. Yeah. No, if I see if I if I do the hot This is me now. Oh, bro, he shit on himself. Oh.